This episode of Geared Up is brought to you by National Car Rental. Take control of your travel experience with National Car Rental's Emerald Club. Visit nationalcar.com to find out more. Apple makes a bid to bounce back in schools. From GeekWire.com in Seattle, this is Geared Up. I'm Todd Bishop. Andrew Edwards is off this week, but I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by Frank Catalano, GeekWire contributing writer and columnist and a longtime education technology expert. It's great to have you here, Frank. It's fun to be in. Thank you. Absolutely. So you covered this Apple announcement at a school in Chicago this past week. A prep high school, actually, that Apple had a long relationship with uh, that uh, it actually introduced its an everybody can code type approach back in December. So it was, and it's a big deal because you may think, well, why is this different? So what, who cares? Apple makes an education announcement. If you're of a certain age, you think, ah, Apple's always been big in education, right? Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say that. So we have a lot to talk about on this week's show, including what Apple unveiled there, which included a new iPad targeted to schools. But I'm in my mid-40s, Frank. Apple, I think of as dominant in schools. I grew up with the Apple IIe in, uh, I guess, high school, I guess that was, or elementary school. I can't remember exactly when it was. But then I went on and I used the early Macs in college. So I just look at this and say, okay, Apple is the leader in education. Is is that still the case? It's funny how our classroom perceptions persist through our adult lives. <laughs> the answer is no, it's not the case now. Uh, if you go back in a time machine and you go back to 1978 to maybe the mid-80s, late 80s, and you look in computer labs, you'll see rows and rows of Apple IIe's and Apple II Pluses. But Apple, which once had that as, and I apologize for the pun, a core market <laughs> in education, yes. Uh, lost that over the years, and especially lost that since about 2012. Okay. So I know that Google in particular has come along with the Chrome OS, especially in the U.S., and really taken over the market and surprised even Microsoft Windows. So you're not even talking about the traditional two computer vendors in U.S. K-12 through education anymore. You're talking about Google, of all things. And, you know, Google did extremely well when it introduced uh, the Chromebooks that were op optimized for education. They were designed to be these sort of laptop lights, right? Netbooks, we used to call them, which are tied to the cloud, have a complete keyboard and screen, about 200 to 300 bucks each, therefore potentially disposable, right? Very affordable for cash-strapped schools with free software, G Suite for Education. So Google Chrome OS really leads the market now. So that is the context for this news announcement, this big event that Apple had in Chicago. Give us the rundown. What did they announce? So looking at this marketplace right now where Apple essentially is a distant number three in the U.S. K-12 schools after being uh, a dominant number one as recently as 2012 with the iPads and mobile computing device shipments, you had Apple coming out for the first time since 2012 in an EdTech-only announcement saying, we got a whole bunch of new stuff for you schools and students, and you're going to love it. And it was aimed primarily and squarely at K-12. What was most interesting was that they led with an iPad. A lot of people expected they'd lead with like a, a Chromebook competitor or a Windows 10 device competitor, which had a keyboard in integrated. It didn't. They led with yet another new iPad where the keyboard is a separate add-on, but one that is not significantly cheaper either than what it replaces. So I know they're going to be selling this for two ninety nine to schools. So that that is less than it costs for consumers, which will be three twenty nine. Right, which is what three twenty nine is the pre predecessor iPad's price as well. But this one is souped up and has a lot more features than its predecessor. The new uh, the new iPad, which has no new name, it's just the iPad uh, at two ninety nine for schools, three twenty nine for mere mortals, includes a much faster A ten Fusion chip which they say runs basically at 40% faster speeds for traditional CPU tasks, 50% faster speeds for graphic tasks. That's important, and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, it includes uh, accelerometer, GPS, uh, gyroscope, uh, includes for the first time in an entry-level iPad Apple Pencil drawing tool support. Big deal for schools and creativity. So it includes a whole bunch of new stuff, uh, a retina display, 9.7 inches, a lot of things that are designed to essentially say, this is a really good iPad, and here's the kicker, optimized for augmented reality. Okay. 
So is that why the GPU, the graphics processing unit, is so important? Is because of the AR, the augmented reality? Very much so. And plus, you know, there are just a lot more graphic intensive applications with video and such that kids are using these days in schools. So I know, obviously, that kids and people in general are used to augmented reality through games, things like Pokemon Go. But you have a much better sense for the state of technology and education these days. Are augmented reality apps really taking off in the classroom? There's hope that it will. There still is not a business model where people will make money doing it and providing those to schools. But it's hopeful that the hardware can lead the way. If you look at what Microsoft has done with HoloLens, with what they call mixed reality, uh, really the combination of augmented reality and then possibly virtual reality at the far end, there have been a lot of people trying to get into this market and thinking education is a great place for it because of virtual field trips. You look at it, Google Cardboard, for example, with right. its uh, expeditions. Uh, all the major players, Microsoft, uh, Apple, Google, really think that AR and VR is a place in education. It has a really good foothold there. The problem has been cost and uh, hardware capabilities. Yeah, and I can just imagine, too, and maybe I'm underestimating the IT skills in the typical U.S. classroom, but gosh, it's hard enough just to get the computers to work right. I can't even imagine like what it would be like to get an AR application, something more on the cutting edge. And I realize I'm thinking really short in a short-sighted way, I guess, in a, you know, five, 10 years, maybe it'll be much more common and easy to do. I don't know. It just seems like AR is a bit of a reach to me. So I was a little bit surprised to see this announcement. Well, I think also it's not necessarily that Apple thinks that there is a business there with that today, but how does Apple differentiate itself in the marketplace? Yeah. How do they make themselves look cool? Because that's really what Apple's been all about since 2007 and the iPhone. It's been about cool. That's true. But in schools, is it about cool or is it about cheap? It's about both. Okay. Uh, you're trying to be cheap because these are taxpayer-funded dollars in K-12 yeah. schools. They're, they're buying in bulk. It's much like an enterprise or a government sale because that's exactly what it is. So that's the cheap part, right? The cool part is because teachers <laughs> and parents. Got it. Right? So you want to try to entice them to go ahead and want to use and advocate for the schools and districts to buy the Apple equipment. So that's where it is. And there has been this sort of tension uh, with Apple, because as it has gotten more and more cool and more and more expensive to buy Apple hardware of any kind, you know, $1,000 iPhones, yeah. uh, schools have been hit very hard with budget cuts. And with they never really completely recovered from the 2008 Great Recession in terms of how much money they have to spend on education materials and ed tech. So you have these two kind of colliding imperatives where Apple is cooler and cooler and more and more expensive and schools are getting more and more cost conscious. Okay. So I want to ask you overall how Apple did in terms of repositioning itself against Google and Microsoft. But there was one more announcement and that was a new version of iWork for the iPad. Yeah, there were a whole bunch. Matter of fact, it's hard to keep track of how many announcements yeah. if I could count them. The iPad actually could have been a consumer announcement. They could have waited a month and announced it with other consumer stuff because consumers can buy it. So it's strategically important, I think, for them to have announced it at an education event because they wanted to put their foot in the ground. And they actually said the iPad is our vision of the future of education and the future of computing. So they put that foot in the ground. It's not going to be a Chromebook competitor or a Windows 10 uh, laptop competitor. Uh, the other announcements they made aside from that were a new version of iWork that you can now author books without having to use iBook Author from inside iWork. Mm -hmm. That's new and important for schools when students want to put together portfolios and show their work. That's an important piece, and it's free and available for download right now. They also announced a bevy of school operations classroom management software. Uh, in addition to Classroom, which they've always had, which allows teachers to see what students are doing on their iPads, uh, they're going to be porting that, by the way, to the MacBook, which has not been available for the MacBook before, just the iPad. They announced something called Schoolwork, which I personally think, but have no confirmation of, is tied to their acquisition of a company that did learning data analytics called LearnSprout in 2016. But essentially, uh, Schoolwork uh, and another uh, product called Apple School Manager will allow them to essentially get up Apple IDs for everybody in the school from an administrative standpoint. It's a big deal. Schoolwork allows them to assign uh, handouts, watch student progress from a teacher's standpoint. So all of these tools essentially allow them to compete with Google and Google Classroom, G Suite for Education, as well as Microsoft with all the tools Microsoft has for education. Office 365 Education, Intune, all of those. Right. Windows 10S is the version of the operating system that Microsoft came out with just for schools. They announced it at a similar type of event last year. I believe it was with Satya Nadella announcing that. So 
Similar to how Apple did this with Tim Cook. So basically what this does is it puts Apple back in the playing field with everybody else, with Google and Microsoft. They're playing catch-up from a, a position of third. But, you know, they've got something that Google Google has to a point. Microsoft is desperately trying to regain it with Satya's work. But they have cool. Apple has cool. It's an expensive cool. And it's a huge bet for them not to include some kind of a keyboard with these for the upper grades for writing and online testing. But heck, you know, you can't count Apple off. People counted them off in the 90s, too, when they came back. All right. We are talking about technology in schools this week and Apple's announcements at its special education-oriented event in Chicago. Coming up next, we're going to be talking more about tablets, including a new Chrome tablet from Acer. That's coming up. Plus, with all of this, can Apple actually make a comeback? I'm going to be putting that question to Frank Catalano, who is sitting in for Andrew Edwards this week here on Geared Up. We'll be right back with more on Geared Up. A big shout out to National Car Rental for sponsoring this week's episode of Geared Up. Hey, Road Warriors. The latest tech puts me in the driver's seat every time I travel. Control your travel experience with National Car Rental's Emerald Club. You can bypass the counter and choose any car on the aisle, so you have more time to listen to Geared Up to find out what's going on in the world of consumer electronics and gadgets. Go national. Go like a pro. Check them out at nationalcar.com. Subject to availability and other restrictions requires enrollment in the complimentary Emerald club welcome back we're talking about apple's announcements and school technology this week i'm todd bishop from geekwire.com in seattle you're listening to geared up and i'm here with frank catalano longtime geekwire columnist and contributing writer and an education technology expert for many years it's great to have you here frank always a pleasure all right so in addition to apple's announcements this past week there was a surprise twist on the chrome front There was a Chromebook tab announced by Acer. Now, for people who follow the Chrome OS, typically there's a keyboard on these things. Typically there is because that was part of uh, Google's push when it came to the Chromebook is no compromises. Under $300, under $200, you get the keyboard, you you get the screen, and everything is up in the cloud with some local storage. But with this announcement, it's a 9.7 inch Acer Chromebook tab 7 for $329 targeted at schools. So basically the keyboard is gone. This was a big surprise. Well, it's it's a it's the same size and what's interesting to me about this is it's the same size as the new iPad and the standard iPod 9, 9.7 inches, but it's Chrome OS. And I think what this shows is that Chrome OS has taken over the K12 classroom. Uh, Android tablets are not likely to occur even though they're also pushed by Google in the US anyway. And this is sort of the acknowledgement that, you know, you want to you want something with a keyboard, you want something without a keyboard, you can now get it all with Chrome OS. And Acer was a very early adopter and pusher of Chrome OS in the Chromebook format. So for them to do this is not a surprise. So I would think, though, that keyboards would be key throughout K through 12 education. Correct me on that. Well, they're more important when you have to do online testing and writing, and that's usually grades five and up. For the younger grades, a keyboard is essentially optional, and that's where I actually I think uh, Apple's seen a lot of success with its iPad is in those early grades, and that's where I think Acer expects that it will see with its Chrome tablet a lot of that success. I also don't think that it's a surprise that the re- normal price of the uh, the Acer tablet for Chrome is $329, which is the consumer price of the iPad in the same form factor. Okay. Do you think that this could compete effectively with the iPad? Because among tablets, the iPad does fairly well among U.S. schools, U.S. K-12. through I think there's a very good chance that if I am a Chromebook school district and I have basically bought into the whole Google ecosystem of G Suite for Education and Classroom and the Chromebook, and I want tablets... For, for a number of students or for some other purposes, maybe as digital textbook uh, replacements, replacements for textbooks, I might go with a Chrome one because I can manage them all from the same, same console. So let's talk about where education is overall, K-12 through education. We mentioned at the beginning that even though the popular perception among older generations might be that Apple really rules in this market, they, they don't. They have about 4.6% market share in the U.S. in 2017 with the Mac OS Uh, The uh, iOS has about 14.7%, and Chrome in the U.S. really just rules with about 58.3%, according to Future Source Consulting. So if you look at this and you take into account what Apple announced this past week, what is Apple's shot of getting back? 
I think it's a long shot, but it may be the only one they have, candidly, because Apple does not want to reduce the perception that it's a really premier brand, right? And they've pushed that so hard in, in, in the consumer market since the iPhone's introduction in 2007 and, and onward that they are the high-priced brand, but you get value. You get, you get what you pay for. And to come out with something that's like a, a sub-$200 Chromebook clone – running uh, iOS or macOS would completely undercut that perception. So what they're hoping for, my speculation, is that schools that are already invested in the Apple ecosystem will not leave them because now they're giving them an even more powerful iPad for the same price. Yeah, you got to add a keyboard on it for the higher grades, but you had to already. So they're trying to avoid hemorrhaging any existing school districts. And by also looking at how cool AR is, and Apple has this long reputation of also knowing the future of technology, or at least saying they do. They're hoping that they will entice a school district who want to be on the cutting edge to go ahead and buy into the Apple ecosystem as well. So I am skeptical, in case it wasn't already clear, about the whole idea of AR, augmented reality in schools. I think that it's hard enough to get the computers to just work and turn on and, and you know run without bugs. To add on top of that, some really advanced technology, this whole idea of holding up the iPad and having an app that that shows objects on the real world around you, augmenting the world. I don't know. It just seems like a stretch to me. Correct me on that one too, Frank. Well, there is no business model here yet for yeah. AR, for the people who create the uh, the AR apps and software uh, and in education. And, and that's probably the issue. You know, AR and, uh, and VR are seen as much more popular in gaming right. as low-hanging fruit. Right. But education is seen as kind of a good secondary market because you can essentially overlay historical facts on a, on a site or on a document. Uh, you can show on a regular table how physics works using AR. So I think there's a lot of hope that there is a business here somehow. There certainly is interest in it in education. Microsoft has been pushing what it calls a mixed reality with its HoloLens in education. Uh, Google has been experimenting with its uh, Google Expeditions using Google Cardboard, the really cheap kind of uh, VR-ish, AR-ish type goggles. And now Apple wants to get into this game too, and they think they have the, the cred, if you will, the cool factor, and the hardware to pull it off. So will it actually be the next big thing? Hard to say. 20 years ago, Qualcomm which makes chips for mobile phones, thought it was the next big thing and pushed it for years in education, and it never took off. So and, we'll see. And to some extent, I may be underestimating the current state of augmented reality. If you look at things like Pokemon Go, at least there's a, a, the potential for people to embrace this kind of technology. So There is, and, and I think the real key will come, what will students themselves create, for example, using AR? Uh, one of the big parts of the announcement that, that Apple had was integrating AR kit modules inside of Swift Playgrounds, which is their uh, app to teach kids how to code. So kids could theoretically create their own AR apps. That will be fascinating to see what students themselves do when they're not hampered by expectations of administrators and teachers of what education should be. What can it be might be more interesting from the student perspective. So we've been talking a lot about U.S. K-12 through education, but it's fascinating to look at the stats elsewhere in the world from Future Source Consulting, which tracks shipments of these PCs and mobile devices into schools. Windows, it's like the, the heyday of Windows. They're like 62% in the rest of the world. And then if you look at Android, that's 18.7% outside of the U.S. What's going on? Why the difference? And, and how do you explain that? So in the U.S. market, and just to be clear, the one thing that uh, FutureSource does not track is desktop computers, because they, but everything else. They pretty much track everything else when it comes to K-12. In the U.S., it's, it's a Chromebook world. You know, and we've already discussed that to some length. Windows is number two, and they've slowly been gaining ground in the U.S. And then Apple is, you know, tucked way, well below Windows in all of its various pieces. And Android is a rounding error in the U.S. In the rest of the world, Android has a much larger share. And part of the reason for that is you have ministries of education who can do top-down implementation into schools, saying all of our country's school districts will adopt Android tablets because they're free, the OS was at least perceived to be free, and we will manufacture the tablets here in our country, and everybody will get them. We don't have that kind of a structure in the U.S. because the U.S. Department of Education, as powerful as people think it is, really only accounts for about 10% of school budgets. So that's why I think Android is much more popular in the rest of the world. It also had kind of like the free OS thing going for it long before 
Chrome OS and Windows OS became affordable for a large number of schools. Also in the rest of the world, Windows does much better than it does in the U.S. And again, uh, there could be a number of reasons for that. And Chrome does not do nearly as well. Yeah, Chrome, just to look at the latest numbers from 2017, about 7.6% market share for Chrome in the rest of the world, 187 for Android, 626 for Windows. What's interesting on the Windows numbers is they've had a resurgence in the rest of the world in K-12 through education from 2014 when they had dipped below 50% market share, Windows had. So obviously when they've sort of had a, a comeback there, which is odd to say. Yeah, I think it's a large part of it has to do too with the fact that Microsoft has been very aggressive in its price points on Windows and also window devices from partners. Uh, they do have a lot of those internationally. So they're at the under two hundred, under three hundred dollar point, like a lot of Chromebooks. Uh, Google and its Chromebooks may not have done as well in the rest of the world, and this is speculation on my part, because don't forget they're cloud based. So even though there's local storage and even though you can run some things locally, unless you've got a really good Internet infrastructure and really good campus Wi-Fi, whatever school you're at, Chromebook's not going to work all that well for you. Okay, Frank, I'm going to give you a little thought exercise here. You are a school administrator. You can start from scratch. You have an average U.S. school budget. You're neither... Uh, you know, in in a place that's uh, you know impoverished or or nor affluent, which one do you go with? If you're like a, a middle of the road school district, do you, do you bet on one platform over another? Is this putting you in a difficult position? <laughs> of course it is, but let me try anyway. I would actually look at a number of factors. One is I'd look at are there devices that are out there that are durable. That's one of the things I want to be aware of. A $200 computer is no bargain if it breaks in a year and a half. Yeah. So I'd, I'd keep that in mind. So I would look at durability of the, the devices and who's making them. Are there companies I've heard of? Is the company that's providing the ecosystem, the OS and the so-called free software that goes with it, likely to be around in a few years and, and keep supporting the education market? And that's key because Apple, Microsoft, and Google, education is not their main system. It's not, it's not the main business they're in. It's a part of their business. So I want to make sure that whoever is doing it has a long history in education is likely to keep supporting education. And then three, I'd say, what's the what other products are out there, apps from other companies that support it? If I were a district official in the U.S., Microsoft would fill those bills because Microsoft has been desperate to be successful in education for years. Google probably still too. And maybe Apple. Because Apple really counts on people to use its software and its hardware, and it's a sole source provider. There's no competition for buying Apple hardware. There is for Windows OS hardware, and there is for Chrome OS hardware. So Apple would probably be my third choice based on those factors if I were a school district official, answerable to a school board, spending taxpayer dollars, and loving my job. It's interesting on your second point, the question of whether these each of these companies is committed to the market. It's fascinating that you've seen the CEOs of each of these companies do education-related events in recent years and recent months to try and really make that statement. Hey, we're here. We're going to stick around. I mean, when you trot the CEO, whether Sundar Pichai or Tim Cook or Satya Nadella, you're making a statement that this is important to us. I think part of it, too, is that they're creating lifelong consumers. You know, when you get a kid uh, in a school to use your device, you're hoping they will continue to buy that brand, uh, that type of OS for the rest of their professional careers and recommend it. So, you know, and there's a lot of free software. So it is like they used to say in the schoolyards, first one's free. And uh, hopefully this has a better outcome for the students <laughs> than those other people peddling stuff on street corners. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, thank you very much for coming in this week, Frank. It's been great to get a good glimpse of where things are in terms of the overall education market. And you also covered all of the Apple news for GeekWire. So thanks very much. My pleasure. All right. Until next time, I'm Todd Bishop. You're listening to Geared Up on GeekWire. Thanks for listening to Geared Up, the weekly tech and gadget podcast. Check out more of Andrew's reviews at youtube.com slash gear live and follow all of our coverage at geekwire.com.